My presentation would be a little bit different than the presentation that we already heard. Because in my presentation, I will not speak about genocide. I will not speak about murdering children. I will not speak about other heinous crimes against humanity. My main task of my speech is to give you some insights what is the art market and what, why should we even care about something what is like the nothing more but a piece of art, some object. Why should we protect objects when the children are dying, when the civilians are killed and the prisoners of war are sentenced to death. But in the second part, I will also give you some insights. How was possible to steal the work of art in the majesty of law? How was possible that during the centuries, our perspective of human trafficking was relatively negative? but our perspective of the trafficking of human object was neutral and even in some countries it was positive perspective. But before going in details, I would ask you to remember about your last holidays. Maybe of many of you decided to go abroad, many of you decided to go to the capital of the uh, cultural heritage, what is Rome. And if you go to close to the Colosseum metro station, you will see the beautiful building of Colosseum. And if you decide to take a walk in the direction of Ark of Titus, you will see the sculpture. You inside the Ark of Titus, you will see the relief showing Roman soldiers carrying objects. What are the objects? The objects are uh, Jewish religious artifacts which, are, which were the loot of Roman military campaign conducted in Jerusalem. It was in ancient time something to be proud of because it was example of military force. And we will see that human mentality didn't change for the next 2000 years. Just before going further, we have to make some remarks on the meaning of warfare. What is the main purpose of war? To kill? No. To enslave? Neither. The main purpose of war is to gain profits. The profits in the ter territory, the profits in the term of politics, the profits in the terms of influence, and the material profits as well. And for many centuries, the works of art, the cultural objects, and other subjects which we will consider as a cultural heritage was nothing more as the equivalent of something precious. So it was totally legal, legit, to steal it. Because as we know from the history of international law, the law of war was the one of the first branches of law because the warfare was the legal way of disputing, of solving problems between the states. And war looting over centuries didn't actually change. It was the way of acquire the property legitimate even in the civil war. So the, during the war time, the property of enemy was less nullus, like in Roman law, just it means it belonged to nobody. That's why it was perfectly fine to take it as the loot of war. And because war, it's not for free. When we fight, we must eat, we must have our money, we must uh, have energy, and what's most important, we must have motivation for another military campaign. 
And this award, this treasure, was the property of the enemy. If our enemies were rich, the more motivation we had. And going to the time of 16th and 17th century, I would like to give you some examples how it was possible to steal in the majesty of law. Yes, you hear correctly, to steal, not to destroy. Because we will put another meaning of destroying cultural heritage, but first of all, it was much better to steal something and to sell it with the profit than to destroy and to not have anything. For example, imagine you were a Spanish soldier, you want to get rich, what do you do? You sign a deal, sign a contract with the king of Spain, which was called encomienda, and it was possible to go to Latin America without any soldier. Because if you sign the contract with the king, it was possible to make a pillage, to looting the, uh, the, the tribes of native uh, Indians of, of America, and it was in the majesty of law. Because the law uh, which was constituted in the Spain considered America as a part of Spain. And on the, this part of Spain, it was perfectly fine to, uh, to uh, steal in when, under one condition, you should make those Indians Christians. And if you make those Indian Christians with the baptism, then it was possible to uh, take their property. Another example is from 17th and 18th century. For example, you can imagine it was the part what was the rise of British Empire. And for example, the British used, the, in many cases, the diplomatic law. And for example, one very important case was the British ambassador in the Ottoman Empire, Lord Ergin, who took the marbles from Parthenon just because he was he was the friend of the uh, Ottoman authorities in, ancient, in, in, in that time Greece, and he took the ancient uh, treasures of Greek, carried to London, and for today they are in the British Museum. Another way of looting in the majesty of law was the policy of very famous French leader Napoleon Bonaparte. When he decided to make a truce during his military campaign, he used the act of international public law, and as we can see, I give you some examples. For example, treaties of, treaty of truce between the French army and Duke of Parma and the Duke of Modena. French army will leave you in peace, but uh, the Duke will deliver 20 paintings at the choice of general-in-chief. And the Duke of Modena will be obliged to deliver 20 paintings from his gallery to the general-in-chief. It was one of the conditions it, which allowed us take the property of the enemy for us. And it was perfectly legal because as a warring state, we had this position of power that we could dictate our conditions of a truce. Okay, because we're running out of the time, let's make a quick jump to the Second World War. And during the Second World War, the theft of works of art was possible because of the administrative law. The Nazis in the occupied territories used the administrative law to collect all of the uh, works of art, all of the uh, subjects of value, just to safeguard them. Safeguard to collect them. But as we know from the Nuremberg trial, it was like a fake news. Nobody wanted to safeguard those pieces of art. And the main responsibility man, the Alfred Rosenberg, who was one of the prominent Nazis, and uh, he established his task group, uh, Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, was this agenda which was responsible for taking all of the arts uh, from entire occupied territories. All of the books, manuscripts, uh, religious objects, and all of, belong all of Jewish belongings. And as we uh, know from the Nuremberg trial, uh, the tribunal rejected the notion that the work of art were secured for later protection. 
Uh, the evidence collected uh, showed, event, uh, showed that it was confiscated just to enrich German nation and individual Nazi officers. Uh, and Nuremberg trial, of, among other things, uh, convicted and found guilty Rosenberg from crimes against uh, peace, uh, looting property, destroying property of cultural heritage in all of his occupied territories. And as um, our colleagues before already said, Nuremberg principles was the beginning of the modern uh, international criminal law. Let's go further. Uh, to this uh, post-war time and to the very specific element of international law, which is the Hague Convention. Because the cruelty of war uh, was the main point when the international community decided that it be, must be something below the international communi community which will safeguard the, uh, all of the cultural property during the armed conflict. Why? May we can ask. Because it was the first moment when we realized that the cultural property is something more than just a piece of art. This is something more than something what we can sell on the market. This is something what is our common heritage and can build our identity as a humankind. The theft of work of art, the destruction of work of art, would be a crime not only against the owner of this art. This would be a crime against the whole humanity and the next generation of humanity. Because the whole humanity would be deprived to have the contact to their own heritage uh, as it is, is the art. But there are the loopholes. Like in every document, there are loopholes. There are some elements which are the exceptions of the main rule. And in this convention already meant, we have the Article 4, which uh, mainly it prohibits destruction and um, theft of art, but we have one exception that it could be waived only in the case of, of the military necessity appears. And I, as my colleagues before said, military necessity might, be, might have a very broad interpretation. And let's make another jump to the jurisprudence of ICTY. ICTY, in the cases against Jokic, Strugar, uh, Kortic, and Czerkes, just point out what I already said. The bombing of the old city of Dubrovnik was the not only attack of the region, but all the cultural heritage of humanity. The whole site can constitute a place which is under specific protection from the point of view of international law. Their attacks on the people identity might be perceived as a, a crime against humanity because the whole humanity will be defected with this crime. Let's go further and let's go to the ICC uh, ruling in the Mahdi case. As we know, there's only one judgment in the case of cultural heritage by the ICC. It was 10 years ago in Mali when the jihadists uh, linked uh, to Al-Qaeda destroyed uh, mausoleums dating for the 14th century, burning also uh, 2,000 pieces of uh, priceless manuscripts. They justified their action by the basis of the radical interpretation of Islam. In this case, it, it was one of the shortest cases in the ICC, by the way, uh, of course, the, the court 
mentioned the crimes against property are of lesser gravity than the crimes against per people. Uh, but what we mentioned before, 60 years before and now, the key words are that the crimes against culture and the identity of people is the crimes against the mankind. But it was the only case. No, it was not. Because in 2018, we were witness of the Turkish airstrike against the Kurdish people. The Turkish military operation Olive Branch destroyed the temple in the northern Syria. More than 140 Kurdish civilians have been killed. The 3,000 year old temple was destroyed. This is everything what we can see, what was the result of the airstrike. And can the Turkish officers be taken to the criminal responsibility? The answer is negative. Because it was another loophole, which I mentioned before. It was the military operation against terrorists in Syria. As we know, from 1980s, Kurdish people are one of the enemies and they are proceeding as the terrorists. Kurdish political party are on the list of the terrorists. Kurdish military organization are even bigger terrorists. All of the present, all of, during the uh, presidentship of uh, President Erdogan, we witnessed that the Kurdish politicians were deprived of their rights and they put to the prison just because of the action which are the against Turkish integrity. And the case of this airstrike was the violent, violent case of using military force. It should be a crime of aggression. But Turkish justification, this act was in the self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. And this self-defense was preempted and proportional to the threat. Of course, it was no, and it wasn't any threat from the organization in another country. And what's more, the, what, do you remember what was the key word which I mentioned before? The military necessity. The destruction of the temple was a side effect of the fight against terrorism, and this action was motivated by the military necessity. Moreover, as we can think, is it possible to have any charges against Turkish officer? No. No Turkey, no Syria, are the, neither Syria are the state parties of the Rome Statute. Maybe we can use universal jurisdiction, but the country who will think that universal jurisdiction and the trial against the Turkish officers is possible is nothing else as the declaring the war against Turkey. So this is a, the sad example that the mentality of humans didn't change since 2000 years. And it is reflected in the Roman Pademia inter alma seal and legis. It means under the arm during the conflict, the law is silent. And what can we do? In 2021, the ICC published the, the, uh, the policy in cultural heritage. In this policy, in this PDF document, we can read more than 100 pages about cultural heritage. But the main conclusion is the ICC just encourage states to make a national criminal, criminal law on art crimes more strength. Also, 
not only the destruction of cultural heritage is a crime, but also the theft of work of art, which is not literally mentioned in the um, Rome Statute. Also, ICC encouraged states to digitalization and cataloging the national cultural heritage in member countries just in case of the theft. And what Marius already said, the key is the knowledge. Knowledge is power. And to raise the awareness of heritage is not the object, but is a common, our common identity. And as a conclusion, we will protect only what we love. We will love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we learn. And let's learn that the cultural heritage is not something what we can put in the bank. It's not something what we put, can put in the museum. Cultural heritage is a part of our national identity of, and our human identity. And that's why we should put all of the efforts of our national legislation to protect it. Thank you very much for your attention.